So we're now entering the, session, the second session of the day. We still have two panels. This morning, the debate was very lively, and I'll please encourage to keep the question, the Q&A active in very British style with the Q&A sessions. Um, so this morning, we touched upon macro teams. Then we moved into technical debate around uh, access to capital and capital union. And then we have very lively debate around global strategies and com competition. Now, let me introduce our next speakers. We have Vittorio Colau, CEO for the Vodafone Group, Diego Piacentini, Senior Vice President at Amazon, which will be moderated by Francine Lacqua from Bloomberg. The debate earlier touched upon two very interesting questions or points, which I'll leave open for the next panel. We've been discussing about roamings, and we've been discussing about closing Amazon on Sunday. So I'll leave the question open, and I'll please welcome on the stage our next panel. Thank you. We have one hour to talk about companies, leadership, um, how we're going to rechange the world, so we better get straight to it. Guys, thank you so much for joining us to talk about leadership and the challenges facing your so companies. So no roaming and no Sunday. So probably, if that's one of your biggest challenges, which may be roaming for some, and which may be the internet and how you deal with regulation around the world, it might be one of uh, the, the biggest leadership challenges that you have, although maybe it, it's not. So I'm going to ask you the very first question is, what do you see as the biggest risk to your companies in the next 12 months and in the next five years? How much time do you have? Two minutes. <laughs> so uh, I would say the biggest risk is uh, how we become a $100 billion company, which is our today, by still thinking and acting as a much smaller company where things move really, really fast. Uh, especially in, in the places where we work, in the sectors where we work, speed is more important than many other values in company. And how do you adapt yourself, kill any attempt of building bureaucracy within the company, and, uh, and uh, make sure that fast decision, even wrong decision, but fast decision can happen. This is the biggest um, cultural and leadership challenge we have within the company, and it is both 12 months, in both five years. Vittorio? Uh, in the short term, so if I look at the next year, clearly the stability of Europe or the recovery of Europe and uh, good regulations uh, is clearly the thing that keeps me uh, busy, uh, given the fact that we are 55, 60% exposed to Europe. So I would say that is the short term thing. The long term thing is not, is different in its source, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's the same thing that Diego mentioned. So we need to evolve the company. Telecommunications are becoming communications. That from mobile, you're becoming converged, fixed entertainment, applications, cloud, blah, 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 5G, et cetera. The biggest challenge is to make sure that we continue the evolution without allowing complexity, bureaucracy, which is one of the dimensions of complexity, but also complexity of regulation, complexity of technological platforms, complexity of models, business models across different uh, geographies, kill us either from the cost or from the uh, effectiveness thing. And again, it's a leadership uh, challenge because it's how to keep the pace and how to manage the pace of the change in a very complex organization. But Diego, when you, when you look at that, and when you look at what you're saying is basically trying to be this $100 billion valuation company, but at the same time being a little bit like a, a startup, right? So you're flexible, you're smart, so you look at disruptors, you adapt, you change. Does that come from the top, or is it a culture that you create within the company? Mm -hmm. By the way, interestingly enough, I said $100 billion, you interpreted valuation, I talked about revenue. They're pretty close in terms of it, but it's, uh, I, I was really referring to the dimensions of and the size of the company. Um, it, does come from the, it does come from the top. I mean, going back to the theme of uh, leadership, which is the main reason we're here, um, leadership within the company is shaped by the corporate values of the company. In our case, 
and we're, we're talking about a company that is turning 20 this year, so we're kids, or teenagers, is still shaped by the value of the founder. I mean, don't forget, we're in this very peculiar situation where the founder is the CEO, the CEO and the founder own 26% of the company, and, uh, or something like that, and uh, <clears throat> most of our shareholders are long-term value shareholders. Now, the way this is structured has been chosen from the founder at the beginning with values that are about long-term, pretty much ignore quarterly results, uh, be willing to be misunderstood, which is meaning, I know that if you need to disrupt a change, most of the people, some in good faith, some in bad faith, you'll say that you're wrong. And if you have created this culture of saying, I'm kind of listening, but at the end of the day, I'm focused on what I'm doing, that at the end of the day shapes the culture and the value of the leadership of the company. So the short answer to your question, yes, it comes from the top. Vittorio, you're at the top, so what do you do to ensure that actually the company remains focused on execution and at the same time remains, I guess, aggressive and innovative enough so that you, you become number one? Well, uh, I can tell you what I do. I'm not sure it is enough, but uh, first of all, uh, one time uh, somebody told me something which is, is completely right. You know, all, the world is full of consultants that sell you, you know, change cultural program, whatever, you know, all these nice ways to improve the culture of your company. And somebody once told me something completely right, which is, listen, if a, it's very simple. If the company has a good culture, it's the, the merit goes to the front line and to all the people in, in, a, in a broader sense. If it has a bad culture, the guilt is with the leader and, or the leaders in general. And it is absolutely true. So bad cultures come in general from absence of good principles or building on, on, on what uh, Diego said, the inability to challenge the established way of doing things. So practically, I always do two things. One, what I call contrast and compare. If we do things this way and somebody does it in another way, why? If in this market this happens and in your market it doesn't, is there an opportunity? So this type of contrast and compare culture that you, know, you always, because we are all a bit lazy, we all kind of, you know, the established way of, uh, of doing things is a very seductive concept, one. And second, which is uh, the, the, a little bit linked to what Diego said, a culture of pushback, of not accepting the first answer and uh, saying, yeah, do you know or do you think? Do you have the facts or this you heard from somebody else? Is it really impossible to do this in this market because the, law, the local law doesn't allow? Is it really technology? And this ability, I am uh, full of respect for his type of companies, require a very competent leadership. So you really need to understand things in detail. And the, Silicon Valley and the West Coast companies are really great in that because they have been able to keep the competence very high. Now, more traditional companies, eventually you become a generalist, but you lose a little bit. Thing. So and that's why I'm obsessed in understanding how things work and understanding exactly what is possible and what is not. It requires a lot of time and a lot of passion for what you do, but eventually that's the only way, I think. And you both have companies, actually, that are really at the forefront of all the changes that we've seen, be it digital, being the way that we start interacting with our phones, or we talk about quad play, the way that we look at videos content. And for you, of course, the way, we, Diego, we, we look at uh, e-commerce and the way we buy. So again, how do you keep in touch and how do you foresee trends? Is it, is it a man's genius? Is it a person that says, actually, you know what, all kids from 19 years old to 30 in the next two years are gonna want this kind of thing and so we have to look at algorithms? Or again, is it a culture where people come up with ideas and you filter? I'm gonna let you go first. Ah, okay, that's a good <laughs> tactic. Uh, first of all, I think it's really, uh, again, there's no, not a single answer, I think. So you, you have to be. I can tell you what we, uh, what we do. Uh, I think that the problem in most, not, not companies, also organizations, you know? It's interesting that I was talking to Andres Tironi and I was talking to, uh, to Diego before this panel, and the topic was exactly the same. We were in three different words, but the topic was how do we make sure that you have enough time to think, to do that, sorry for exposing our private conversations, but to ensure that you have enough time to think about the future, to think, and not being sucked into now. He has you know, an easy way. He doesn't take appointment you know, for more than two weeks, so his diary is always good. We have different you know, ways. 
what we do, I tell you what we do. Uh, we, try, we try to expose ourselves to those who know. So, for example, again, two days ago we have an executive committee at Vodafone and we were challenged on why are we not all tweeting and all be more digitally present as leaders. And the, the interesting thing was that we had to bring in a very nice young colleague whom I've never met before, who is really into this, to challenge a little bit our way. Because otherwise, now of course, my general counsel immediately reacted by saying, careful, Vittorio, it's very dangerous. You know what you, <laughs> Vittorio tweeting Saturday night, dangerous. Uh, the head of consumer says, yes, but I am the only one who can talk about customers matters. And the technology guy says, you guys are not competent enough to tweet about new technology. So, and this guy actually was there in the room to give us comfort that, you know, it's not as bad as it looks. And so, you need to expose yourself to frontline, go to shops, go to things, ask questions, and, and, and have the time. And to me, the, the topic we were discussing before is the important one. If you don't have the time to expose yourself to the young generation, to the people who really know, and, and or to the frontline, eventually you lose competence. Is that right? You clear your calendar for two weeks, or, so or at least for two weeks? It's interesting. I think that his statement so. needs to be qualified, <laughs> which is, um, it, it is absolutely true, starting from Jeff, uh, we have, uh, over time, stopped taking hard commitments about meetings beyond what is a decent foreseeable future, which happens to be these days two weeks or three weeks. Because at that point, you don't want the calendar and the schedule to drive your decision-taking activity. You want to, to drive that to be driven by what needs to be done. And let me give you an example. Um, for some of you might know, we launched in New York uh, probably like a month ago, a service called Prime Now. Most of you know what Prime is. Prime Now allows customers in New York to receive products in one hour for, for if you pay something and in two hours if you don't pay for free. This has happened in reaction to the fact that A, we're looking at customer trend, but we're also watching the startup the competitions was doing, right? The, the risk of the incumbent being displaced. And uh, talking about the various Instacart, uh, Google Express, and realized that the customer is evolving into moving from, it's not enough to give a free two-day delivery, but we're getting to the point where you need to get to the customers much quicker. And that's what brick and mortar do. At the end of the day, they are there. And uh, e-commerce is two days today, or it could be also next day, but it's, it's about shortening that amount of time. Short story, in order to react to that, a corporation of our size, 140,000 people, in general, if it's good, takes one, one year. If it's really fast. We are able to launch an app for Prime Now within two months. And starting from Jeff, canceling all the meetings of the following week, because this became way more important, finding the leader for that team, which means displacing another team, creating a separate technology, because Amazon has become a big website with a lot of layers of technology on it, so building a separate app. So Prime Now, today, is a separate application. It's not part of the Amazon shopping application. In that moment, we're able to launch, within weeks, something that is uh, shaping what is going to be, in three, four years, uh, e-commerce needs for consumers. But is it much more difficult, Vittorio, to have that in, a, in another structure? I mean, Amazon, um, as Diego was saying, is so different to actually a lot of the other companies. And it's true that you have to remain fast. I was reading an article about McDonald's, and one of those problems that they were having is that to come out with a wrap, for example, that the healthy consumers wanted. It took a year and a half because they had to go through the board and processes and checks. How do you ensure if you have, if you're not, you know, founder and majority owner, how do you make sure that that happens well, fast? First of all, Diego, you will be the most hated person by my colleagues as of Monday, because of course I'm going to try to transport some of these ideas. <laughs> and uh, the corporate governance calendar of Vodafone will be completely devastated by your comments. Uh, or partially, only partially, don't worry. Uh, it is, there are some differences. I mean, of course, the beauty of those, I, I, it's very interesting. I was having a discussion with, uh, uh, and I think again, I can share it because it was public, with the CEO of Microsoft. 
which is West Coast but different you know, in nature. And, and we were really comparing our companies, our type of companies to theirs. It's true that they have an owner. They have somebody who can be single-mindedly obsessed with one thing and say, investors meeting, thank you very much, I don't go. Uh, Washington, okay, somebody else. So there is an intrinsic advantage in that, but it is also a little bit of an excuse. So I, I really believe that corporate corporates or large organizations sometimes use that as an excuse, so I don't blame it on boards or, or, or regulators or things. It's a little bit uh, a different way of, of running things, which I don't think can be completely applied, but it's not just the presence of, uh, uh, it's really a, a, a mindset, the presence of the entrepreneur is a mindset, is a way of working, but then you have to be very consistent in everything, the way you recruit people, the way you pay people, the way you promote people, the way, so the difficulty is not saying Vittorio on Monday goes and says, you know what, track. Uh, I free up my calendar, fantastic, and I can go and stay three days in the shops and do my own thing. The difficulty is building the system which is consistent with this, because then you want the others to do, you want to, launching that thing in two months, I can tell you, is amazing, is really amazing. And it's not the app, the problem, is the, everything else. And they had and everything else ready to build and to work at that pace. So it is a completely different way. And I think that large traditional, more traditional corporates like mine should learn a bit of that. Maybe we cannot completely go there, but we shouldn't use the entrepreneur as the excuse. In general, do you think companies have too many meetings or not enough? Yes. Too many. Companies are meeting factories. We, it's uh, sometimes the main quality product of a company is the meetings, no doubt. Um, True. I think the issue is the useless meetings. I mean, at the end of the day, there are some useful meetings. And actually, this decision that I just described was produced in a meeting. And, uh, and uh, obviously, I think all of us had children that asked us, what do you do, Dad, during the day? Emails and meetings. And, uh, and writing. We do a lot of writing at Amazon. Um, but the, to me, it's more about the flexibility, which I understand has a chain effect, right? Because if your schedule is flexible, people reporting to your schedule needs to be flexible and goes down. And in some environments, it's totally unmanageable. So I, I, I get the downsides of that. But that's, uh, that's, that's the part. Uh, what he said is also very true, which is he mentioned about the day, the day you shape the leadership and you hire that kind of people. And that's the cycle that you include. One of the things that allow us to do that is that we are very draconian with our compensation scheme. I mean, one of the things which is this huge simplificator, I think, our decision at the very beginning to not give up is that we have a very simple model, cash and stock, nothing else. We don't have bonuses, we don't have corporate cars, we don't have fringe benefits, we don't have anything. And beginning, and believe me, at the very beginning of Amazon, it was really, really hard, especially when you're opening a new country, uh, a new activity, to not listen to the local guy that says, oh, you cannot hire anybody in Germany unless you give corporate cars. The point is that it is true that it's much harder, but it's not impossible. And, and so we insisted back when we opened Amazon Germany that we're not going to give any compensation similar to the market in Germany, but had the courage to impose our compensation philosophy. Did it take us longer to hire people? Yes. Did we hire the people that were similar to our leadership principles? Yes. And at that point, you get the virtual cycle going. We do make our mistakes. Not everybody's like this. I mean, I'm just giving you the positive side of that. I want to ask you a little bit about the, the consumer of tomorrow, which as leaders you have to, of course, imagine, look at, and then uh, get cash from. And then, uh, and then we'll ask a little bit about retaining talent. How, what is the consumer of tomorrow that you're looking at, Vittorio, in terms of telecoms? Is it, does every, you know, we talk, on, for example, on Bloomberg TV almost every day about uh, the battle for the living room. Is that, you know, what does an 18 year old now who'll be 25 in, in seven years want? Does he want to have one platform for everything? You know, again, we, we, we should not be simplistic. First of all, what is the consumer of tomorrow? There will be plenty of segments, plenty of different, uh, of different things, and different companies will find different ways to, to, to serve it. But in general, if you're 
ask specifically about my my uh, my sector or my or my activity. There is no doubt that the consumer of tomorrow is a consumer who will be uh, digitally super hungry, not hungry, super hungry. What we are seeing is an explosion of uh, personal consumption in all possible ways of, uh, of data and, and will be completely intolerant of, of malfunctioning. And that's the reason why we have started you know, the biggest CapEx plan you know, ever done outside of China uh, in, uh, in two years, because we really want to upgrade the infrastructure. But it goes much more beyond that. The consumer of tomorrow is like, I mean, ideally my son, who is 14 and a half, my son is completely intolerant of any malfunctioning of anything, doesn't even think of calling a call center to resolve the problem, goes on the web, goes on, on the app, intrinsically not, and this is a mistake that I often read in marketing, kind of cheap stuff. They say the digital guys are, are, are uh, disloyal or unloyal. No, no, they're not disloyal or unloyal. They're super loyal to this guy because he does a fantastic job. They are completely intolerant of malfunctioning and therefore they are intolerant if the company fails the promise. And therefore, the reason why we are trying to b bring back the promise to the customer the, the bond, the contract with the customer at the center is because that will be essentially the only guarantee that you have a continuing business. It doesn't matter whether you're Amazon, Vodafone, or, uh, or, or whatever, Sky. Get it wrong, consumers will not tolerate it. The letters that I receive and that I read of people complaining, I mean, of course I read, I receive, and I call them, but it's the thing of the past. The new guys will not write. Now, the other great thing Will they want a single platform? I don't think so. I think they will want to be able to access all of their content seamlessly from everywhere in a multi kind of fruition type of model. Some of them will use 100% of the functionality. Some of them will say, no, I'm fine with one. But the ubiquity, the security of the access, the storage is going to become the core of our digital life. Diego, is it a similar profile to you? And totally they want agree. things fast. I just want to add different angle, it's hard to, I don't want to re-say the same things because they're completely true. One of the things that we ask ourselves about the generic question, the consumer of the future, what's it? First of all, we're trying to answer the question, what is that is not going to change? Rather than predicting what's going to happen. And at least in our business model, some of the things we know will not change or will just get incrementally better. It might be a revolution to get there, which is, I'm sure that customers will not ask us to charge higher prices. I'm sure that customers will not ask us to do a slower delivery. And I'm sure that customers will not ask us to do uh, a more difficult website. No, but it, it does help. So you have that kind of a paradigm that you know you will need to keep improving on those aspects. The mobile part is completely true. And that's, it's also a meaningful issue for us. Because all companies today, with very few exceptions, and the exceptions are the company that were created by people slightly older than his son, old, as old as my son, who's 23, which has stopped using a PC or probably never used a PC. And uh, therefore, for many companies, going to be the, they think mobile as the migration from PC and mobile. The fact is that it's going to be mobile, period. And, uh, and therefore, it's not, it's not a migration, which from a technological standpoint, is a, from a user interface, from a customer behavior, is a huge switch. There are companies in India today that do not have a PC website, meaning that you, do, you go on a, on a, on a, on a, on a personal computer on the internet and you can't find it. They just have the mobile version. And some of them don't even have the browser mobile version. They just have an app. And that's, uh, and that's, that's why many companies could be disrupted if they don't understand how to go there. And that's the biggest part. Diego, do you have any facts or figures of how much we shop online in, in different countries? And actually, if you look at those, what is the, the one thing that surprises you? Is there a country that you thought would be much more online that is less online, for example? No, actually, the surprise is always the opposite. Well, my country. Everybody was telling us, oh, Italy, nobody wants to buy online. They don't trust the... Uh, they don't trust the postal service. They don't want to give you a credit card number. They were all myths, meaning that they never had a great service and they never had a sophisticated delivery system. And once you create the offer for that, they respond. 
So the point, if the surprise was, was on the opposite side, not on the, on the um, less than more. It's usually more than less. And one final question, then we'll get on to retaining talent. Um, Diga, when you look at, so I was reading something on, for example, on supermarkets, and I, I don't know if it translates into Amazon, but I think it probably must. If you go in a shop and I spend 100 pounds, if I buy, or if I'm looking for the same things online, I actually spend 120 or 130. Is that true? Is there a translation that because you're online, you actually buy more or you're enticed more, and so therefore your spending goes up more quite significantly? Um. I wish it was true. <laughs> it is, I would say, the biggest factor is how much money you have in your pocket still. It's at that point you can't do that. But definitely, I would say that, uh, actually, I have evidence of the opposite, meaning that online is much easier to jump from one place to another than offline. Comparison. You walk into a Tesco supermarket, and you might find that the price is slightly higher, but Maybe it's not worth it to walk out and go another place. You are online. Online today is the perfect representation of the classic uh, theory of economics, which is perfect information. Today, the consumer is in a position to have perfect information, and it's the perfect demand and supply. Obviously, there are, I'm oversimplifying, but a consumer goes online and can easily check. That's why the disruption will happen. I mean, having the lowest price and the fastest delivery is not going to be enough because having the lowest price and the fastest delivery is going to be easily copied. It's actually being easy, easily copied. I'm not telling you by, by who, so otherwise you stop buying from me. But um, you see what's happening with Alibaba in, in China. So those factors are easily replicable. And online, perfect transparency, perfect information is the factor. We're talking about a lack of time and how you juggle, of course, strategy, execution. How much of your time do you spend trying to groom the next leaders, or at least you know, people at the management level, leaders that will um, give you the support that you need to grow the company? Very hard to, uh, to kind of quantify it. I, uh, one time per year, usually when I go to Australia and New Zealand, because it's a very long trip, I look at my past year and I classify the time and I see how much I spent and so on. But the reality is that uh, developing internal people is, I mean, every meeting is, every interaction is developing your own internal people, and it's very important. There is one word that I hate, uh, to be honest, and I try not to use because I really think it's philosophically wrong, and this is this concept of retaining talent. Because retaining, to me, sounds like, you know, there's a talent, the talent wants to go away, and, you know, you have to pull because otherwise the talent would go away. And I always say to you know, in my internal meetings, is, guys, we need to develop, develop, develop. And once you develop, you have choice. And if somebody decides to go, great, good for him or her. But eventually, you have the pipeline. And I'm really obsessed about the pipeline. So I really enjoy talking to everybody. I mean, if you ask me how I spend my time, I spend a lot of time talking at all levels in the organization. You have to be very careful, because again, this is another thing that upsets the hierarchy. They say that you run by anecdotes and all these things. You have to be very transparent with your colleagues, but the input from everybody in the organization is an input useful you know, to me, but it's also a way to interact the other way down. So again, occasionally, regularly in meetings, uh, the coffee, every opportunity is, is good for doing that. So I, I don't think I have a, a number, but I can tell you that, uh, for example, we dedicate a session every single executive committee, because we do have scheduled meetings, uh, unfortunately. Well, we do too. <laughs> uh, we dedicate at least one hour just every month to discuss about the top people, and at every level this happens and so on. It's, it requires a lot of time, but at least it gives you the certainty that you are. And then the interaction one-on-one -on -one is, uh, invaluable because that's where the thing happens. And Vittorio, what's the most difficult? I mean, if you look at, for example, you know, if you quantify it as, I don't know, from 20 to 25 or certain stages in life, right, as you progress through the, um, the ladder, career ladder, is there a group that's more difficult to motivate than others or more difficult to develop? Because, it, it, I mean, different people defy, require different things, it's right? It's a super, super, super good question. I, I really think it depends a lot on the company. And it depends a lot on the opportunities that people perceive that they have. If you are a, a kind of a company that is a, a pretty static and doesn't give opportunities and so on, the group which is most difficult to, to motivate is, of course, the whatever, 38, 42. So the guys who don't see the opportunity, 
they have already made enough career and then they start you know, doing like this and it's what you know, in management books is called the cement layer. They become a cement layer in the company. It becomes impossible to go through them because they defend the existing uh, status. But then again, it's wrong to blame it on them. You should blame it on you because it means that you have not created the right lift elevators going up and down and eventually out to really keep, uh, keep them uh, motivated. I find, for example, the younger kind of the fantastic generation, fantastic, open, transparent, very you know, telling in terms of what the customers want and so on. The problem is, at every point in time, give the opportunity. So every time I hear people saying there's a cement layer and I hate my bureaucracy, I say, well, problem is, look at your pipeline and you look at who comes up or down. Diego? Um, again, creating the context of the fact that we are a company that is growing 20 plus percent a year going into multi-businesses, which does facilitate the fact that you st we still have a lot of room to hire and a lot of room to develop. So giving that in mind, for which we're also in a lucky situation, for which we have opportunities. Um, clarity of uh, leadership principles when you hire people. I mean, it needs to be super clear what the leadership principles of the company has. It does happen that our leadership principles are real. I mean, we live them and breathe them. So for us, it's at the end of the day, you can identify this is the person with the characteristics I need and do they represent at least some of the most important leadership principles. The other thing that we have learned as a company, we are a little bit naive, is that it's not about the net balance between strength of a person and weaknesses of the person but it's about how big are the strengths and how, man how, how can you manage the, the net liabilities, that part. So it's not about the net, it's about is that person really, really good at something and can that person add value? So once you learn that part, uh, you obviously hire people like that. Um, we are far from Six Sigma in terms of 99.99% uh, .99 accuracy in hiring rate. We're still probably between two and three sigma. We're in the 80%. Um, in terms of development, again, it's still our biggest development activity is the fact that we're getting into so many different businesses. I mean, the same example, the prime now, we found a, a, not even a vice president, a director level person who was qualified for that. And within three days, she was put into that role. Um, we had looked at, does she have at least those three strengths that we need? The answer was yes. We'll move from one job to another. So you need to have also the flexibility to move people around. You don't have to go through the, and we told her boss after the decision, so you didn't have to go through that. Kind of, can I ask for permission to someone else? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you generate that level of uh, flexibility that allows the development of the people. Then, I, I didn't touch on the fact that we do have development activities, both formal and informal. Um, I personally, going back to one point he meant, when I travel, I always try to have as a, as a habit to have a breakfast with two or three levels down from me, people with seven, eight, ten maximum, and there is no specific topic, it's just for them to ask questions, their, their bosses are intentionally not there. So those are, those are just anecdotes of how you can slightly build upon that. Are, are salaries important? When you're, when you're looking for leadership, or is motivation enough? Salaries are important because they are one of the elements, but at the end of the day, uh, apart from a very small segment of people who, you know, no judgment, but they are only motivated by that, most people are motivated by the fairness of the environment they work in, the opportunity to do things, and at the end of the day, good human, what is called climate, in the office. So, Yes, salary is important because if you don't pay the right salary, sooner or later, <laughs> talent walks out of the door. But it's not the most important thing. Can, can I add something? Because you, you, you reminded me, and again, the, the real great development opportunity for everybody is to be given a new project, a new thing, and be, say, okay, now swim yourself. The problem in many companies is that if you are Amazon and you grow 20, 25% per year, there's no problem. But if you are a more normal company that grows one, two, three, or maybe minus one, minus two, minus three, that becomes the problem. And that becomes the problem because you have fewer of those. And then 
the, the career becomes the only thing that matters. It's not the development, it's not the new thing, but it's the career. And then people become defensive and, uh, and things. And this, I think, ties a lot back into what we were discussing before. If the leadership has time to think, to look into new projects, to play with new ideas, then you identify, even in a 3% situation, the opportunities. If you are completely stuck in managing the emergency or, or the urgency, then you end up, uh, so again, we all do these things, but I, I had a, one of those nice breakfasts in the morning when a guy in a country that we remain unnamed told me, we tell you, this is great, this breakfast, I really like having breakfast with you and it's a great opportunity. Now, this is the fifth breakfast with you that I have. When do I get my opportunity? And I was kind of, well, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's the fifth time that you eat as a talent with me, probably, <laughs> I should give you something. So that's the real, the moment of truth. Totally. That's why each of my answers starts with the context. We are a growth company, we are a 20 year old company, we have a lot of, so I mean, those are the necessary condition. It's, it's, it's a nice talk to say you can motivate pers people that if you're, if you're happy when you're growing minus 3% and your objective is to cut costs and not to grow, all those leadership, nice words that I've said, believe me, they're, they're really true. hard to, just true, 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 but it's much harder. It's not, on the company, which is why it's great that we have the two actually quite different companies, but you know, playing in the same space. Um, Vittorio, talk to us a little bit about diversity. This is one of the things that was mentioned in the other panel, and Vodafone did something quite unique just a couple of weeks ago in announcing maternity leave. 60, well, tell us, first of all, what it is, and it, it did send shockwaves in certain parts of the world. Yes, I, uh, I, I think we all became unemployable in the US. Uh, no, uh, we, we always had a, a lot of attention on the diversity issue and uh, not just men, women, but also Western uh, emerging markets, engineers, non-engineers, and so on. The, uh, we just had a lot of policies. They are working, but they are not delivering as much as we thought. So with an objective of having 30, 35% of female leadership, we are at a good, but not great, 22, 23, and it's very hard to go up. So we identified, we analyzed the problem and so on, and we came to the conclusion that we have a moment in the career of our uh, female colleagues that is very difficult, which is the maternity, and where, uh, depending on the countries, sometimes you have safeguards, sometimes you don't, and in some countries, the safeguards are fairly limited. So we announced, I think, to my knowledge, there's the United Nations, who have a similar policy, but private companies, we don't know many, a global worldwide maternity policy which says if you are a, a, a mother you, or mother to be, you stay at home for four weeks with full pay, four months, sorry, 16 weeks with full pay, no matter what is the, role, the, the rule of the country. But most importantly, I think, after that, when you come back for six months, you have full pay, but you only work 30 out of 40 hours. And you discuss with your boss whether this is two hours less per day, one day off, two afternoons off or whatever. And it sent, I mean, to be honest, we thought it was a good thing, but we couldn't imagine that this would have got such an internal, enormous support, but also externally, of course, in the US, they were shocked. We were called to CNN and so on. And as I said, nobody will get an offer, a job offer from Vodafone in the US anymore. But, you know, we really think it's important because we thought that for our company, and I believe for all companies, that's the moment in life where you need to support uh, uh, female managers and executives, but also normal frontline people to make the transition from a certain type of life to another type of life. It was highly debated internally, but I think we did the right thing. And do you think that will actually change the number of applications, or, or is it for something internally? So, so does it change the way well, that uh, younger females see their career at Vodafone? To, to be clear, first I think it will change the number of non-returning mother that we have, because we have a high number of non-returning mother, which means more training, more recruiting, take the them, take them up, re retool the whole thing. So first of all, we do it for a good reason, which is it's expensive. It's a, we did a KPMG, we commissioned a a work to KPMG, and they said that the worldwide the cost of non-returning mothers is huge, but it's a hidden cost. You don't know it because you say, hey, uh, she's, she didn't come back. Hire another one, hire another one, hire another one, and, and you go and you go with this. Second, we think that clearly has sent a strong signal to our colleagues, female colleagues, that we are committed and it is possible to have a family, two, three. Of course we have, I mean, women on the board, women in the executive committee, but that's not the point. That's the top of the company, you need the whole pyramid to be, to be filled up. 
and so it's a, and third of course this has given us uh, a lot of uh, credibility so I doubt any woman receiving a call from Vodafone or from a headhunter would say I don't want to talk to you so it's the whole thing it will take years for, of course it will take years but I think it was the right thing to do and Diego, how do you see, so you were talking about the fact that, for example, it was difficult at the beginning to hire people in Germany because they were uh, expecting to get a company car, which Amazon didn't provide. It, you know, this competition in terms of either benefits or perks or call them what you want, the corporate package, how much do you think about that? Uh, before I answer the question, she's been very nice. You didn't ask me what we do at Amazon because they're way worse than they are. So she's been, she <laughs> took American. me out from the embarrassment. We so, know. <laughs> uh, he's going to talk to his management team on Monday. I already emailed my HR people after I heard about this this morning. <laughs> and I want to learn about that. So I really like the idea of it's short-term financial expensive, but it covers some cost in the long term that you can't assess. I think this is a very wise idea. And the West Coast which is the country of Cheryl. evolution and the country of, uh, of uh, Cheryl and leaning and everything, is the worst in terms of the uh, percentage of, management, of women in the management team. It's the worst uh, for some biases, technology versus non-technology, so it's a reproduction of what school system produces. But I don't think we are doing enough, we haven't created enough mechanisms to, to, to change the needle. This is one of the best ideas, actually the best ideas I've heard. Going back to your much easier question, um, again, it's the willingness of, uh, I'm giving the similar question, or trading off the short-term benefit for the long-term benefit. It is at the end of the day is, uh, uh, yes, I might lose an interesting candidate, but at the end of the day, that person needs to be motivated by different factors than the one that person is explaining to me. If the person comes only because you give a BMW 520 or 735 on top of the package, most likely that's the person that's not going to work with us. I mean, so it's not going to work, meaning that two years later, he's going to go to the company that will give him the BMW 800 series. And uh, one of the things that we look at, this is one of the things that I really think Jeff Bezos got it really right from the beginning, is that we privilege missionaries versus mercenaries in terms of, of people that work with us. And there are some incredibly smart mercenaries, but missionaries in our environment work much better. And so there are some countries where the economy is, boom, going like this, like India, where we lose people because they go, it's, by the way, it's the same thing that happened in the US in 1999, 2000, exactly the same thing. It's the bubble. In India, everything is exploding. We pay them, I don't know, 300, and they have an offer for 800. If you start doing that, or trying to go, first of all, it's going to 350 is not going to change the decision. So what we have decided to do, which is, was like a natural decision, we just have an open door policy, which is half of those comes back. They come back because they go out, they experiment, they know that the 800 is not really 800. They know that the company is not really what they thought it was. And uh, we allow them to come back. And actually, every year, we call them. I'm sorry, we call the one that we are unhappy they left. And, uh, and we called it. So we, we had, at the end of the day, try to retain, I, I like what he said before, uh, people which six months after they will go anyway for, on another offer. It's, uh, it's just making, you know, adapt to the environment making sure that you have enough pipeline to replace them, which has its difficulties in a fast-moving economy, um, and have an open-door policy. I remember, just one second, I, my first job after working in Bocconi for a few months was at an Italian company called Fiat. And uh, when I told them I was leaving to go to Apple, which they, I'm talking about 1987, so it's way before uh, Apple Italy had just started like one year before. Um, I was called by the head of HR, capo del personale, and I was expecting him trying to understand why I was leaving and everything. He just told me, remember, if you leave Fiat, you will never come back. That's all he told me. <laughs> Which is... Which was absolutely a correct prediction. <laughs> uh, 
uh, one last question, and then we're going to take some questions from the floor. Vittorio, when you're both leaders, and I guess a lot of people want to be leaders, not everyone wants to be a leader, but what kind of advice would you give your 20 and 30 year old self? So if you look at your career progression, um, and, it, and it's probably easier if, if we make it about you, because then it'll be more personal. So first of all, your, your 20 year old self, and then your 30 year old self. Well, I, can, I can share what I what I say when I go to when they invite me to go to to Bocconi and to talk to the undergrads. I can I, I have almost like four recommendations for them, and the, the first one is more relevant when we attend. The first one is today go around the world, learn cultures. Don't be obsessed with the first uh, one or two choices of jobs. Be more uh, interested in the learning and uh, and the opening of your experience to the world. I, we, I think, have in a way or another similar lives. We started both, interesting, I didn't know you did the same. I did three months I lasted in Bocconi, then they kicked me out. So it's interesting. Yeah? Uh, we did a sport thing, then we went into international jobs, and then we ended up in different parts of the world, and now we email a strange time, times of the day, you know, each other. Uh, today, it's incredibly more open, incredibly more open earlier on, and, uh, and, and so I, I always say, learn, go around. So when, you're 30, when you're 30, to me, what, let me tell you, I see many 30-year-olds making mistakes because they make career choices. The most important thing is select well your boss or your bosses and the company and the culture of the values you work for, because career then materializes almost uh, uh, naturally in the second part of your 30s, but the early part of the 30s is super important that you have uh, uh, the good advice. So go around, learn, have fun. I mean, you're young. when you're 30, it's very important to select, and again, the type of things that Diego said are, are super important. We made them the core of what is Vodafone, uh, has been Vodafone and is Vodafone today. Uh, that's the most important thing because being and ending up in the wrong environment. I recognize uh, you, uh, people leave. We say, sure, sure, leave. You know, talk to you in six months' time. Talk to you in twelve months. You will understand that this seems a career choice, but it's a wrong environment choice. And then uh, fly. Um, I will tell you right away that the thirty, I, I completely agree with Vittorio. On the twenty, I agree. And on top of that, and this is a very practical suggestion that I wish I did it, is. Uh, um, I, I do believe that the leader, and he's shaping more and more, needs to be understanding technology. It's, it's, and when I mean understanding technology, and I'm speaking as someone whose boss is a computer scientist, uh, is, is really about making sure that you're focused when you choose your university studies on understanding computer science and math. <laughs> it's, it's a data-driven world. And, uh, it's, uh, and there is, by the way, it's not like you sh choose humanistic study, therefore you're stupid in mathematics. No, it doesn't work that way. You, you need to make sure that you want to understand quantitative methods. It's, it's, it's something that is so important. I found, and, and that's, by the way, the way we select people. The way we select people, it's, it's, it's definitely it's about values, it's about principles, it's about cultural fit with the company. But at the end of the day, you better know your numbers. And you, you need to understand how the basic statistical algorithm works. And, the, and how, I mean, even being capable of programming is a great thing. It's, programming now is different than it used to be. And that's what I think I underassessed. Well, also because it's hard and you have to work more. I mean, you'd rather give an exam of philosophy or an exam of uh, Calculus too. I know the answer, and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and that's. I think it's. It's people need to understand that value. Uh, Vittorio, just a, one final question before we go to the floor. How do you pick your leaders? Actually, is there, is there two qualities that you're looking for, or is there maybe a faux pas that actually, if um, you know, if someone will come up to you and say, "I want to be your CFO," or "I want to be one of the leaders at Vodafone," that they is there a type of person that you really don't want in the company? Yeah, I don't, it's very easy to answer whom I don't want. It's more difficult to answer who I want because I am a bit less dogmatic. I think there's many leadership styles, there are many leadership characteristics, and at the end of the day, again, diversity also is good in leadership styles. You cannot be, I want this type of thing. 
partially their type of companies work a little bit more like that. We are different, and maybe it's the business. Maybe. I, I tell you what I don't want. I don't want people who have, uh, um, uh, let me say, I don't want to say lack of integrity, but, you know, dubious integrity. Or, or shaky, uh, shaky links between uh, between behaviors, principles, and uh, and the way of working. Because sooner or later it will show uh, in the in the office. And uh, I don't want people who are too obsessed with their own career. We had a case two weeks ago of a fantastic woman, by the way, who we wanted to hire and. Uh, ready to make the offer, she started becoming incredibly obsessed with the, defi the job description, the definition, the boundaries, this, this, and that. And the more, and this was a discussion with, you know, almost the person who had to sign the contract. And at some point, you know, when this thing came back, not to me, but uh, it was told the story, and, you know, our HR people said, you know, do really want somebody who is so picky? And then we said, what, what's hiding? Has she been good at hiding this in the interviews? And now it's coming out. And I think the decision was correct to say, listen, you know, Probably let's stop the conversation. So that type of uh, of leadership we don't want. Uh, and then uh, I I'm less dogmatic on math versus calculus versus these things, but transparency and fact checking. Fact that I never found a leader, even the visionary. I mean, I you you met Steve Jobs, you met even the visionary ones. They are incredibly accurate with facts and with you know, hard information. So it's a bit of a myth that, you know, these are creative types that, you know, at night they dream the iPhone and then they do the iPhone. It's not true. They are amazingly detailed and uh, so whether it's BMW, I was at BMW recently, I was amazed by, you know, the amount of information that they put into deciding whether the handle has to be done like this or like that. So leaders are with a lot of integrity, careful with facts, and then, of course, good communicators, good co motivators of people, because that's important. But less prescriptive on math and calculus. <laughs> so if you're good at marketing or sales, come to me. <laughs> How can you be good at marketing without being good at math? But, sorry, I was answering the question what I would have done if I were 20. That's what I would have done. Uh, can I take questions from the floor, please? Yes, on the right. And can you please say where you're from and who the question is to? Guido Bikiza from Luxembourg. Uh, at the beginning you were talking about leadership and you were talking about the importance of uh, having fast decisions. And I'm wondering in terms of values, how you address uh, failure and the possibility that people, in order to go fast, they can go wrong. And how this couples with uh, the latest discussion about integrity. So how can you judge whether there is a mistake or there is a, a lack of trust? Uh, so I'm addressing the question in this way, uh, which might sound like a textbook answer, but it's actually the way we had it. It's you need to create an environment which naturally exists at Amazon for which failure is not punished, period. That's, that's the high level answer, actually. Failure is encouraged which means this is the output. The input is you need to create an environment where you maximize the number of experimentations within the company. In order to maximize the number of experimentation within the company, you need to accept failure. I mean, there is no, that's what it is. And once you understand the failure, you go back and you correct, if they're correctable, the inputs that generated the failure. That's the absolute answer. On the, on the more practical activity, what we do is uh, a much, a very decentralized technological organization. Something that any average CIO would hate the way we're organized at Amazon. Meaning we don't have a CIO. I mean, I have, and I'm probably the least uh, technologically formed person at Amazon, I have hundreds of software developers and principal engineers and technologists in my team. And, uh, and, uh, and we obviously, in the last 15 years, having the lack of working for Steve Jobs and Bezos, I've learned some of it. And uh, the formula is the decentralization of the technological resources. And uh, that allows, obviously, fast movement, fast mistakes, but also occasionally doing faster, I think. 
Super difficult uh, question. I'm not 100% sure that uh, we are good at what you are describing. Um, the, the point is a bit linked to what I said before, is tolerating failure is great, and we have to tolerate failure. And I have to say, when it is failure for good reasons, I mean, I have, again, without naming a case which is very visible where a country made a wrong pricing move, it was with the good intentions, with full transparency, consequences of anybody, no. So recently, I mean, it's a big <laughs> mistake, if you want, but mistake not done because it was hidden or with lack of transparency or with bad intention. No, we did something that eventually didn't deliver what we thought. Has anybody been punished for that? No. The problem, however, is uh, in uh, the consequences on people management and things like that uh, that come. Because if somebody makes a mistake and then there is, again, a new project or something that you need to assign a person to, it is inevitable that there is a lower probability that whoever was involved with that mistake will be assigned to that thing. And so what you need to be super careful is not just uh, uh, you know, accepting a limited amount of failure or a small impact failure, but also be sure that uh, that does not become a stigma that in the company precludes from further moves. Now, I'm not sure we have been very good, we as Vodafone, in that uh, historically. And as a result, this lower the propensity to take risk. Because people say, you know what, I have promotion maybe in one year or a new thing in one year. Do I really want to do that pricing move now? Mm, let's wait. Maybe I can muddle through and then somebody else will have the decision. So it's not purely tolerance for failure, which we have. It's also managing that there is not a big consequence for failure because otherwise people will learn. And organizations are amazingly good at learning instinctively what they should avoid if this is a risk for, uh, for, for, for your career or your job, and then they refrain. So, so I just wanted to add a quick thing that I give for granted at Amazon and I realize that's not always uh, Going back to the My Prime Now example, um, we measure inputs. We don't measure outputs. So we're not going to tell that person who punted, your revenue target is, your profit target is, and your number of customers are, because we would be completely failing at determining the right number. So the inputs for the person is, you need to set up the service in three months. You need to have at least 20,000 items available for, 20, for one hour delivery. And you need to make sure that when you launch the service, it's at least 98% delivery accuracy. And you need to go to 99.9% .9 within three months. So that person is going to be measured on the only measurable things, which are the inputs. We're not going to give that person targets. You need to do $5 million. You need to make money on it, which is not going to be possible for the next 20 years of that business model. And uh, you need to have 20,000 customers. Because if you do the right thing, those things then will happen. So when you have a company whose main activity is measuring the inputs, by the way, we don't ignore the outputs. I don't want to be fun naive. We don't look at profit. We don't look at cash flow. We do a lot. But we don't measure most of the activities of most of our people on those outputs. I am. But most of my people are measured on the inputs that we have learned to generate those outputs. You said something super remarkable, which, however, here I have to pick on you. You said that service, which is great, and by the way, you don't measure the business case, because in any case, it will not make money for the next 20 years under that model. Now, that is something that you can say if you work for a company where the owner controls whatever. Because if I go to any of my, uh, and say, I'm launching this great thing, and it's never going to make money for 20 years, but it's the right thing to do for the customers. And by the way, one day we will figure out the business model. You know, honestly, I do it once. And then I better make sure it's a mega success, because otherwise, the second time you invite another one. The 20 years, by the way, I was making a point. No, it's no, in the longer no, term. No, it's not for no, 20 no, years, literally. Don't take me literally. We discuss with Google, with these people. Sometimes you ask, what's the business model? And they say, there's none. Just the boss believes in it. And I say, well, OK, great. <laughs> but, <laughs> so there are some differences still sure. between the West Coast and the rest of the world. <laughs> David. David from Algebras. Actually, uh, your answer uh, preceded my question, which is you mentioned, both of you, uh, patient capital. I would love to hear from both sides of the pond. In America, you have a corporation with uh, an Amazon, with a core shareholder, core founder, looking for a very long term. You said irrelevant quarterly result. On the other side, you have one of the most famous. Sorry, I didn't say what I wanted to correct you. It's not irrelevant. We don't. Determined, we do not optimize the decision 
for that, which is a very, they're very relevant, but we don't optimize the decision for that. And on the other side, you have the public PLC, um, you know, probably one of the most public in the UK, totally owned. What's the impact on leadership that your own shareholder have on your day-to-day -day action? Because there's clearly a limitation what you can do and what is right vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, a two to three years horizon, which probably is what Vittorio has, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, five to 10 years that you have. So what's that impact in your decision-making process? And does it make a difference between the outcome? It's interesting because you always work in that type of companies, I always work in this type of company. So <laughs> we have, uh, I often talk to other CEOs uh, and uh, we also often talk to people who own their own groups, I mean, uh, like the company that you will never work for. And, uh, and, and there is a difference, but it's less, it is, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than what people think. So first of all, do I feel that uh, you said I have an horizon three years? Honestly, it's more five. If I'm honest, we had just announced this big capital plan. I didn't say I, it will pay back in three years. I said it's gonna be in five and you know. So let's not, again, I'm always very balanced in my position. Let's not exaggerate. If you have a good board, a good management team, a good case, you can go with longer term stories to the market. And actually, sometimes you actually are surprised because the markets really like those. And so it's not completed. What, the real difference is that there are some moments when there are your instinct, your uh, experience yeah, tells you this is going to be the big thing, and there it's very useful to have a founding shareholder, a family, somebody who says, I only have to convince one. Because the problem of being who we are is that I don't have one to convince. I, I will mathematically always have 20% in this agreement, and somebody will talk, and the FT will write, and three analysts will say one thing. And, five. and so the complexity around you is much higher, and you have to take that into consideration, because it's nice to say, I don't care, but the reality, if, if you don't care and as a result, you don't get the approval, then things don't happen. So it's not that it is impossible, but it requires a different type of thing. But I also hear people who have families, fans, so who say, you know, stubborn, doesn't listen, has a wrong idea, and they can do nothing. Literally nothing, including hiring a secretary. So it's more nuanced, I think. Yeah, uh, the only thing I need to add is that one of our leadership principles which is probably the most important leadership principle is be right a lot. So at the end of the day, whenever you take the decision, how it goes, how fast you go, you better be right most of the times. And uh, it just happens that some companies have leaders that are more right than other companies. And that's, uh, that's the way it works. But I also wanna, again, put another caveat. It's not like one model is better than others. It's, I'm just telling you, there are many right models and it's just the kind of model that you apply to that type of company. So it's not that our company is better than other companies, just our model that happens to work for the business, for the company we have created so far. By the way, 25, 10 years from now, who knows? I'm gonna take two more questions. Please, quick questions and then quick answers. You'll make me look bad if I overrun. Yes, the gentleman in the middle there. Good afternoon, my name is Alberto Agnese. I graduated in marketing in 2009 and I come from the Geneva chapter. One of your suggestions is ideally choose your career and choose your manager. Let's assume that on uh, Monday morning, 9 a.m., you will meet uh, your potential manager in a new company. Which question will you ask him or her to better understand if this is the right company for you to do your next transition? and if the person in front of you will be the right manager for you. Thank you. Good question. So this is the day you start, you said? No, the day you interview. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your first no, assessment for the new company. Please, first go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you hire so many people. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, so let me sure I understood the question. You want, you are the, person being interviewed, yes. Yes. correct? You want to make sure, yeah. you want to make sure that the culture fits with who you want to be, to Vittorio's point, you know, what advice do you give to a 30-year-old? Well, um, I, again, I go back to the, to the mercenary versus missionary part. I know this sounds a little binary as a, as a concept, but at the end of the day, I would want to work for a company who has a clear 
mission, is shaping the right vision, and has a cultural identity with my values. Now, I do know that not always people have this choice ahead of them, so sometimes they need to adapt themselves. But I, I gave you the example before. I did not have the same values of the company at that time, which has probably changed by now, and it was the right thing for me to leave. I also made a mistake. I, never, I was too young and too unexperienced to ask those questions. I was just very happy to get a job at that time, so I couldn't choose. But uh, uh, to me, it's just about, it is really about the cultural and identity value between, do I find some resemblance between what I believe in and what the company is about? Yeah, I have a very practical recommendation. You ask uh, to describe the organization, and then you start asking, well, the head of this country, what did he or she do before? This one, what did he do? How old is he? So understand how they have created the current leadership. And you know, very often you get the picture, because you get the picture, for example, when I say, I say, for example, my head of Germany was before there and then did this, and on the other hand, the Indian guy has been promoted internally, the Egyptian guy, we took him to group for learning, and then now he's head of Egypt, and da da da. So understand how they formulate their decisions on people, I think is my recommendation. That's the single most important thing. And when I know that when I'm asked precise questions, it's because the person has done good background research, and inevitably, it's on the things where I feel bad. And so I say, tell me about your, I don't know, X marketing directors in three years. What happened there? I was going to, ooh. Yeah. So that's the most important thing. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.